Welcome to About Scripture, a podcast designed to take the listener deeper into Scripture and biblical thought. I'm Ed Gallagher, Professor of Christian Scripture at Heritage Christian University. I hope to cover a variety of topics with you about Scripture. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Heritage Christian University, where we help students to thrive in ministry. To find out more, go to hcu.edu. We're also partnering with the Ministry League Network. They have free resources to help the local church all over the world. Download the app in the iOS or Play Store, or check out the website at ministryleague.com. And now, welcome to the podcast. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3, 1 through 5. This is the conclusion of our series on angels. This is the conclusion of our little series on Satan as well. And for the past few times I've done this, we have looked for what does the Bible say about Satan and what does the Bible explicitly say about Satan and where are we just taking guesses. And last time I looked at Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, and I suggested that maybe those passages are not talking about Satan. Maybe they're talking about what they say they're talking about, which is on the one hand, the king of Tyre, that's Ezekiel 28, and on the other hand, the king of Babylon, that's Isaiah 14. Now we come to Genesis 3. What does it say it's talking about? It says it's talking about a snake. Is it talking about a snake? Or is it talking about Satan? Well, the way I would approach... Listen, you've listened to me for several months now talking about these things. You can probably guess at this point where I'm going to go. I don't think we need to read Genesis 3 as about Satan. It doesn't say it's about Satan. Uh, It says it's about a snake. So I'm not saying it's impossible to read Genesis 3 as if the snake is really Satan in disguise. Maybe so. But the Bible does not say that. What is the earliest time that we can date an interpretation of Genesis 3 as if it's talking about Satan? When is the earliest that we know this person believed that snake was actually Satan in disguise? That's, of course, the traditional view. Uh, The idea, the The idea that it's Satan in disguise is actually fairly hard to date uh, because passages are going to be debated. So, of course, you got to go outside the Bible if you want to do this. Uh, It's not in the Old Testament, right? I mean, the Old Testament really never mentions uh, the events of Genesis 3 again, which is interesting little tidbit of information for you. The New Testament is really interested in the events of Genesis 3. The Old Testament, it just doesn't come up. All right, so it's the earliest interpretation of the snake in Genesis 3, certainly not in the Old Testament, right? So we got to go beyond that. So I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, If you're interested, I've got it written down, and eventually it will come out in a book. We'll see when that would happen. But 
One suggestion is the apocryphal book Wisdom, the Book of Wisdom. That would be like probably the first century BC. This statement, Wisdom 224, maybe it interprets the snake of Genesis 3 as Satan, but it's not very clear, actually. So we're going to put that in the uh, not clear category. There are other possibilities, but there are definitely also ancient Jewish interpretations of the events of Genesis 3 as if the snake is not Satan. It's just a snake. It's just a normal talking snake. All right, so like James Kugel, for instance, has collected several ancient interpretations of the snake. Um, some ancient interpreters, so Josephus is one, Philo is one, you've heard of these guys, the Book of Jubilees, which is a second century BC document found among the Dead Sea Scrolls and other places. All of them represent the snake as merely a normal talking snake. Uh, for Philo, the snake itself is a symbol of pleasure, just as snakes lie on their stomach, eat dirt, and produce poison, so also the one who loves pleasure is so indulgent that he can hardly lift his head. He feeds not on heavenly wisdom, but food from the earth, wine and delicacies, so that he becomes a glutton. Uh, so that's Philo's interpretation. The snake is symbolic in Philo's mind, but not symbolic of Satan, symbolic of pleasure. All right, so there are different interpretations. Let me cut to the chase here. The earliest clear, this is in my mind, of course, you might think something else is clear that I don't think is clear, but in my mind, the earliest clear interpretation of the Genesis 3 snake as Satan comes in Justin Martyr in the second century AD, where he says it. I, that's what I think is clear when they actually say it. All right, that's, that's my criterion of clarity. Now, is it possible, though, that the New Testament actually does this? That would, of course, be before Justin Martyr. Does the New Testament say that the snake in Genesis 3 is Satan? Well, the, the answer that I'm going to give you is no, it does not. Uh, but I'll go through the passages that might be possibilities here. But the, the important element of the conclusion I've already come to that is, that Justin Martyr in the second century AD, he's the earliest clear testimony that, that the snake in Genesis 3 is Satan. The importance of that is that I don't think we can assume that the New Testament authors would have presupposed this relationship. It wasn't so much in the air. Like all Jewish interpreters knew that that Genesis 3 snake was Satan, so of course Paul knew it also. No, I mean, we don't have evidence to make that kind of statement. In fact, that clear link is not made until 100 years after Paul or Jesus or Matthew or whoever you want to name. So we can't say, I think, that a New Testament passage that might make that link, well, surely it does because everybody knew it at that time. No, no, not everybody knew it. Josephus didn't know it, Philo didn't know it, Jubilees didn't know it. Okay, so let's look at the passages that might link them. Uh, the passages are three. Now, if you know of other passages, you know, we could discuss those as well, but I, I think the passages in the New Testament are three that might make this link. Here they are, Romans 16, verse 20. The God of peace will shortly crush Satan under your feet. All right, Revelation 12, 9, the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. All right, and the third one is also in Revelation. It's Revelation 20, verse 2. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. Now, Paul's comment at Romans 16, verse 20, the God of heaven will soon crush Satan under your feet, may allude to Genesis 3, 15, the curse upon the snake, when God says that the seed of the woman will bruise the snake's head. But Paul does not mention a snake or a snake's head 
or the woman's seed. He does mention feet, though the verse in Genesis does not. The action, crush, in Romans 16.20, and strike or bruise in Genesis 3.15, they're different, and they're sort of similar, uh, for which, uh, and two different Greek words are used. Besides, Paul, uh, perhaps Paul was thinking of Genesis 3.15, but the echo is not very strong in my mind. All right, the two verses in Revelation look much more promising. According to the scholar Ryan Stokes, scholars agree that Revelation 12.9 and 20 verse 2 allude to the Genesis 3 story, but they disagree on whether Romans 16.20 does so. All right. So we can put maybe Romans 16.20, the God of heaven will soon crush Satan under your feet. Maybe that's in the, the maybe category. But scholars agree, says Ryan Stokes, that Revelation definitely links Genesis 3 to Satan. Okay, Stokes himself agrees with this consensus. So you can tell, I've already given away my view, I am disagreeing with the scholarly consensus. Okay, um, so take that for what it's worth. Stokes himself agrees with the consensus, but he also notes that Revelation may allude to more than just Genesis 3. So now I'm going to quote Stokes here. Stokes says, The serpent of Genesis 3 was one of several serpent traditions in the literature of early Judaism and was not the only serpent tradition with which New Testament authors connect Satan. A number of texts in the Hebrew scriptures speak of mythological primordial serpents or dragons. These include Leviathan, Isaiah 27 verse 1, Job 3 verse 8, Psalm 104 verse 26, and Rahab, no, no, not that Rahab, the other Rahab, not the harlot, the monster Rahab, Job 26 verse 12 and 13, Psalm 89 verse 10, Isaiah 51 verse 9. These are serpents. These are dragons. These are mythological monsters that God, you know, defeats. Uh, just see Isaiah 27 verse 1, all right? Uh, that's a good representation. So Stokes still says, Revelation's portrayal of the Satan as the dragon and the ancient serpent reflects such primordial serpent dragon traditions. Well, there it is. I mean, I think he gave away the game there. In other words, while modern Christians read Revelation 12, verse 9, and 20, verse 2, as obviously alluding to Genesis 3, there are other options for the source of the term snake in reference to Satan. And we have already seen that the equation snake equals Satan for Genesis 3 could not be presupposed before the 2nd century AD. The Old Testament sometimes represents snakes or dragons as enemies of God, Without reference to Genesis 3, for example, Isaiah 27 verse 1 says this, On that day, Yahweh, with his cruel and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan the fleeing serpent, Leviathan the twisting serpent, and he will kill the dragon that is in the sea. Leviathan here is obviously an enemy of God. And the Greek translation of this verse labels him with the two animal terms that Revelation 12 verse 9 applies to Satan, dragon and snake. When John, call, John the Revelator calls Satan the ancient serpent, maybe he's thinking about Genesis 3, maybe he's thinking about Isaiah 27, where we find not only the word serpent, but the word dragon. I think that's a plausible case. Therefore, you know, what I'm going to say is I don't think we can put revelation in the certain category. I think we've got to put it in no more than the maybe category. It's not clear. Uh, in any case, revelation does not actually offer an interpretation of either Old Testament passage, Genesis 3 or Isaiah 27. Um, we'll... Leave that there. There's more to say about all these things. Uh, but I'm going to move on. Just think about Genesis 3 now. But surely the snake is more than a snake. I mean, it talks. And it wants to trick Eve 
Why would it do that, want to do that, unless it's God's enemy? Listen, I'm not saying that you should not read Genesis 3 as concerning Satan. All I'm saying is that it makes sense not to do that, even if it also makes sense to do that. I'm saying there are options here. All right? And the Bible is not explicit on the matter. At least I'm saying that. Maybe the snake is Satan. Maybe not. Both readings make sense. Let's think about a talking snake. What I notice in this story is that Eve does not run away screaming when the snake starts talking. She engages in conversation, never asking him how in the world he has the gift of speech. Seems like it's not all that surprising to Eve. Has Eve had conversations with snakes before? Was she accustomed to animals talking? Some ancient interpreters thought that. Josephus thought that. Other interpreters thought, well, just it shows that the animals in the Garden of Eden can talk. In the context of this story, I'm not sure that we're supposed to be surprised that a snake is talking. Eve does not seem surprised. And as for the snake's motivation in tricking Eve, as for the snake's motivation in tricking Eve... What does the text of Scripture say? Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that Yahweh God had made. What's the motivation? The Bible says that the snake is sneaky, crafty. It doesn't say that this particular snake is sneaky, but that snakes in general are sneaky. That is the explanation for the trickery that then ensues. Most readers, or at least Christian readers, have been dissatisfied with this explanation for the snake's motivations. And so they have invented different motivations. Jealousy or some such. We've talked about this. Satan was jealous of the couple or Satan was jealous of something. And so he he inhabited the snake and tricked the couple. But that's not what the text of Genesis says. This is not a situation in which the Bible is silent on an issue, leaving us to take guesses. The Bible is not silent about the motivations of the snake. The Bible says he was motivated by craftiness. It's just that a lot of readers don't like that motivation mentioned by the Bible. By the way, I find it interesting that Christian readers who think the snake was Satan disagree on whether Genesis 1 applies to snakes in general or only to the snake, the particular snake inhabited by Satan. For instance, Augustine took the latter position. He says, though this serpent could be called the wisest of all wild beasts, not in its own rational soul, but with an alien spirit, the devil's, that is. In other words, snakes aren't sneaky. It's just this snake is sneaky because Satan was inside the snake. On the other hand, John Milton represented Satan, this is Paradise Lost, of course, uh, represented Satan as choosing the snake instead of a frog or a kangaroo, uh, choosing the snake as his covering because the snake was already smart. Snakes are smart, so I'm going to choose a snake. But if we take the Bible on its own terms, we have a talking snake which apparently caused no surprise to the woman, And we have a crafty snake that tricks the woman into eating the fruit. The trickery of the snake results in an ages-long conflict between the offspring of the snake and the offspring of the woman. Satan is never mentioned. Again, don't mishear me. I do not mean that Genesis 3 should not be read in terms of Satan. I'm happy with this description by C.S. Lewis. This is mere Christianity. What, this is Lewis here. What Satan put into the heads of our remote ancestors was the idea that they could be like gods, could set up their own, set up on their own as if they had created themselves, be their own masters, invent some sort of happiness for themselves outside of God, apart from God. That's all Lewis. I also have no problem with preachers who say that Satan tempted David to sin with Bathsheba. 
Satan's not mentioned in 2 Samuel 11, but I'm happy with preachers who make that connection. I would just like people to recognize that Satan is not mentioned in the text. And the only way to find him mentioned in Genesis 3 is through an interpretation that not everyone shares, not in the ancient world. As it turns out, there are multiple profitable ways of reading Genesis 3. If I'm advocating anything, it is less confidence that any particular interpreter has the one right way of reading this wonderful foundational story. Many people have read this story uh, without Satan's involvement. Apparently, nearly everyone did before Justin Martyr, who is the earliest datable author who clearly says that the snake was Satan. Many people who have read this story as involving Satan, uh, many people have read this story as involving Satan, and that has proven profitable as well. Nevertheless, I doubt that the original author had Satan in mind, else why not mention him, or the earliest readers, and maybe not the New Testament authors. All right, so there's my conclusion on Genesis 3. And if Genesis 3 is not about Satan, and if Isaiah 14 is not, and Ezekiel 28, well, what that means is Satan is nowhere mentioned in the Old Testament. All right. So here's the conclusion of the whole Satan thing. If we insist on a straightforward reading of Genesis 3 and Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, then we have no biblical testimony about the origins and nature of Satan and no explanation of his motivations for opposing God. We have, in fact, no information whatsoever about Satan in the Old Testament. He is entirely a New Testament um, concept. Now, I recognize that we could maybe say the same thing about Jesus, but there's a difference. The New Testament resolutely insists that the Son of God had been there all along, that he was, in fact, involved in creation. In the beginning was the Word. That he had been seen by Isaiah, John 12, 41. That Moses had written about Jesus, John 5, 46. That the prophets looked forward to his appearance, Matthew 1 and 2, that his death, burial, and resurrection were foretold, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that he fulfilled all scripture, Luke 24, 44. But the New Testament is essentially silent regarding Satan's role in the Old Testament. Because Jesus taught his disciples to look for him in the scriptures of Israel, a Christian reading of the Old Testament is justified in finding Jesus there. The New Testament does not similarly encourage readers to find Satan in the Old Testament. Nevertheless, I think it makes sense to think of the appearance of Satan in the Old Testament along lines similar to how Christians often think of Jesus in the Old Testament. Let's consider the angel of Yahweh. We saw earlier that the angel of Yahweh seems, in some Old Testament passages, to have an identity that overlaps with God, similar to the way the identity of Jesus is presented in the New Testament. It might make sense, then, to think about the angel of Yahweh in the Old Testament as a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God. However, we should also recognize that this interpretation is a guess because the Bible does not explicitly link the angel of Yahweh with Jesus. The depiction of the angel of Yahweh is very suggestive, but no more than suggestive. In my experience, Christian readers are happy to entertain the notion that the angel of Yahweh may be connected to Jesus, but they are ready to admit that the connection is speculative. Actually, some conservative Christian readers I have encountered are so insistent on a literal reading of Scripture that they are quite dubious about a connection of the angel of Yahweh with Jesus. You know, in other words, if I present this idea in church, sometimes I have to like, argue quite 
a bit that this might be the case. People are like, eh, it doesn't say it. I don't believe it. The same is not true with regard to Satan in the Old Testament, as far as I can tell. Christian readers devoted to a literal interpretation of Scripture are often quite insistent that Satan makes several appearances in the Old Testament, especially in Genesis 3, but also in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 and, of course, Job 1 and 2 and elsewhere. They often assert that the reading of these passages in terms of Satan is the obvious and straightforward reading, despite the absence of any mention of Satan or the devil in the text. Whereas they are doubtful of seeing Jesus in the Old Testament, despite Jesus' explicit and repeated declarations that he should be found there, these readers I am describing are without doubt that Satan appears in the Old Testament in several passages where he is unnamed. I would suggest that we see the two situations as at least a little more analogous. As it can be interesting and helpful to think about Jesus as the angel of Yahweh, while also recognizing that the text of Scripture does not make this connection explicit, so also we could read some Old Testament passages such as Genesis 3 or Ezekiel 28 in light of the New Testament character Satan while also recognizing that the text of Scripture does not make this identification explicit, but rather makes other identifications explicit, the king of Babylon, the king of Tyre, a snake. At any rate, a straightforward reading of Scripture nowhere reveals the origin or nature of Satan. The Satan legend that is so familiar to Bible students is not found in the Bible, but developed in the early Christian centuries with some influence from extra-biblical Jewish literature. Thank you.